Uh, here's where we start tonight, though. Chuck Schumer. He, of course, is the leader of the Democrats in the Senate. He's a very familiar figure. He's been around in the U.S. Senate since the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, but it, because of that, it's easy to forget that this is actually the first session of Congress uh, for which Chuck Schumer is the Democratic leader. Before him, for 12 years, the Democratic leader in the Senate was Harry Reid. Harry Reid retired from the Senate at the 2016 elections. But, you know, we knew for a long time in advance that he was going to retire, that he was going to leave the Senate. We knew as early as the spring of 2015. So that was a really long lead time for him to give, where he'd still be around, but we knew he wasn't going to be standing for re-election. He wasn't still going to be in the Senate after the 2016 elections. That turned out to be very valuable time, though. Um, there's a sort of magic pixie dust that alights on members of Congress when they announce they're retiring. When, when, when they know they're not going to stand for re-election, they're not going to have to face the voters again, but they're still there for the time being, serving out their last term. That can be kind of a magic time, right? Knowing that this is their last hurrah tends to have a salutary effect on members of Congress. It sometimes makes them more willing to speak hard truths. It sometimes makes them more willing to rock the boat. And right before the presidential election in 2016, in October of 2016, Harry Reid, knowing he's not coming back to the Senate, knowing he's in his last days, he basically erupted. He put himself out there with the kind of thing you'd really only expect to see from a lawmaker who had to answer to nobody, who knew he was on his way out. He was going to say his piece no matter what. In October 2016, right before the election, Harry Reid sent this letter to the FBI. And it went off like a Roman candle. Dear Director Comey, in my communications with you and other top officials in the national security community, it's become clear that you possess explosive information about close ties and coordination between Donald Trump, his, his top advisors, and the Russian government, a foreign interest openly hostile to the United States, which Trump praises at every opportunity. The public has a right to know this explosive information. Now, at the time, that letter was seen as a very controversial thing, even a wacky thing, for Harry Reid to have done. It was October 30th, right before the election. But we now know, at least in part, that what he was talking about in that letter was this guy. Did you meet Sergey Kislyak in Cleveland? Did you talk to him? I, I'm not going to deny that I talked with them. Although so you did I talk to say, him. I will say that I never met him anywhere uh, outside of Cleveland. Let's let's just so say that much. The only time that you met him was in Cleveland. I, 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 what, that I may have met him, possibly, what it might have been in Cleveland. <laughs> Speaking of wacky. You know, we've spent a long time in the show trying to document and keep track of the massive turnover in the Trump administration. Uh, in their one year in office, they have cycled through more senior officials than any other modern presidency. They're throwing people out of high ranking positions at more than triple the rate of the Obama administration at this time. Right? And that's an unusual thing about the Trump administration. But that fact about the Trump administration was foreshadowed on the campaign where they had the same kind of turnover. Even at the very highest levels of the campaign, they went through people. I mean, no other presidential campaign had a Corey Lewandowski and then a Paul Manafort and then a Steve Bannon and Kellyanne Conway all running the campaign. But it wasn't just right at the very top. In September before the election, there was sort of a, a, a mini kerfuffle. I don't even know if it counts as a scandal. What counts as a scandal anymore? Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a happening in September before the campaign where the Trump campaign distanced itself from one of its own advisors. They, they tried to pretend that they had never known this guy, he had never been part of the campaign. He's not part of our national security or foreign policy briefings. We have a number of people, uh, fabulous people, men and women, as part of our national security and foreign policy team, and, and he's, he's not among them. He's not among them. He's definitely, he's not, he is. Who said he was a foreign policy advisor to us? Who told you that? Kellyanne Conway in September before the election denying that there had ever been a foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign named Carter Page. Carter Cage? Who? What? Hope Hicks at the same time said the same thing. She said Carter Page was just an informal advisor. He certainly doesn't speak for the Trump campaign. Jason Miller was a Trump campaign spokesman at the time. He's one of the people who've since been thrown off the carousel. Uh, but he said at the time, Carter Page has no role in the campaign. This is despite the fact that President now President Trump had himself announced Carter Page as one of Trump's top foreign advisors. 
they're basically trying to disappear him. Jason Miller said, quote, we are not aware of any of his activities, past or present. We're not even aware if he's a real boy. Can you prove it? Who? The reason they tried to disappear him, the reason they you know, pretended before the election that they had definitely never met this guy, he had definitely never been announced by Donald Trump at a Washington Post editorial meeting as one of Trump's top five foreign policy advisors. The reason they tried to pretend that didn't happen is because Carter Page became a problem. He had this big, obvious Russia problem. In 2013, we now know, and the FBI has always known, that he was targeted by a Russian spy ring that was operating in New York City. There was a criminal complaint filed in court about that Russian spy ring. Two of the Russian spies are famously caught on a wiretap describing Carter Page as, sadly, an idiot. Uh, but they did say they liked that he was so enthusiastic. These were spies who were apparently working on sanctions issues. They were trying to get secret intel or at least Native American insight into what sort of sanctions Russia might expect from the United States in the future. So in their efforts to collect economic intelligence in the United States, they targeted Americans to try to make them into Russian assets. And they targeted Carter Page. And Carter Page was, according to the FBI, very happy to meet with them and to give them information and to give them documents. The FBI was monitoring the activities of that spy ring in the course of their investigation of that spy ring. FBI counterintelligence agents paid Carter Page a personal visit to talk to him about those friendly Russians he'd been spending all this time with and to whom he had been giving information. The FBI was monitoring that spy ring. They monitored him for a couple of years watching them operate. In 2015, they busted it up, made their arrests, that members of the spy ring, including the ones who'd been meeting with Carter Page, had been describing him as an idiot. They named those Russians as agents of the SVR, Russia, the Russian Foreign Intelligence Agency. Six months after that spy ring that had ensnared Carter Page, six months after it got busted up and there were those arrests and that announced indictment by the FBI, six months later, Carter Page joined the Donald Trump for President campaign. January of 2016, he started meeting with the campaign in March. That was when Donald Trump announced him by name as one of his five foreign policy advisors for his presidential campaign. He made that announcement at an editorial meeting with The Washington Post. That was in March. In July, now as an announced senior foreign policy advisor to Donald Trump, Carter Page took a trip to Moscow. And he gave what was basically an anti-US pro-Vladimir Putin speech in Moscow at a Putin-connected university. He, he denounced US sanctions on Russia. He would later admit that while he was there, he met with high-ranking Russian government officials, including the deputy prime minister of Russia, uh, as well as at least one official from the Russian gas company, Rosneft. He later admitted that he had those meetings when he went to Moscow that July, although he had initially denied them. That kind of a visit to Moscow let alone that kind of a speech in Moscow, would tend to attract attention from U.S. counterintelligence, right? In the case of Carter Page's trip to Moscow in July 2016 for those meetings and for that speech, he reportedly attracted attention from U.S. embassy officials in Russia, and that in turn renewed U.S. counterintelligence interest in him. And I say renewed because this was only a couple years out from his time meeting with FBI counterintelligence officials about his involvement in a Russian spy ring here in the United States. So summer of 2016, a, a new counterintelligence investigation into Carter Page was apparently opened. That eventually included the FBI presenting evidence to a judge of what they said was their reasonable belief that he was acting as a witting agent of a foreign power. The initial FISA warrant on Carter Page was obtained by some accounts in the summer of 2016. In other accounts, it was obtained in the fall of 2016. I don't have any independent way to confirm either of those, so we're not exactly sure. But it seems clear that a FISA warrant on Carter Page was approved before the election in 2016. We also now know that by the time that warrant was issued, U.S. intelligence officials were already briefing high-ranking members of Congress about Carter Page. U.S. counterintelligence officials were briefing high-ranking members of, college, of Congress about counterintelligence concerns specific to this guy, Carter Page. 
Michael Isakoff was first to report it in September 2016 for Yahoo News, this before the presidential election. Quote, U.S. intelligence officials are seeking to determine whether an American businessman identified by Donald Trump as one of his foreign policy advisors has opened up private communications with senior Russian officials, including talks about the possible lifting of economic sanctions if the Republican nominee becomes president. The activities of Trump advisor Carter Page have been discussed with senior members of Congress during recent briefings about suspected efforts by Moscow to influence the presidential election. After one of those briefings, Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid wrote FBI Director James Comey, citing reports of meetings between a Trump advisor, a reference to Page, and high-ranking sanctioned individuals in Moscow over the summer. He cited them as evidence of significant and disturbing ties between the Trump campaign and the Kremlin. Some of those who briefed some of those briefed were taken aback when they learned about Page's contacts in Moscow, viewing them as a possible back channel to the Russians that could undercut U.S. foreign policy. U.S. officials in the briefings indicated that intelligence reports about Page's talks with senior Russian officials close to Putin were being actively monitored and investigated. A senior U.S. law enforcement official did not dispute that characterization when asked for comment, quote, it's on our radar screen, said the official about Page's contacts with Russian officials. It's being looked at. So, Michael Iskoff reporting, September 2016. This is just a few weeks before the presidential election in November 2016. And with these reports about Carter Page's ties to Russia, his contacts with Russian officials that he'd been sort of denying, counterintelligence officials in the United States briefing high-level members of Congress on the counterintelligence concerns about this guy, Finally, the Trump campaign starts to disavow him. Reid had sent a warning letter in August. He had sent that explosive follow-up warning letter in late October. There were these public reports which have been subsequently confirmed that U.S. intelligence agencies were actively monitoring him, including surveillance of him apparently approved by a judge in a FISA warrant. That's all going on in the fall before the election. The Trump campaign is like, we don't know this guy. <laughs> Then the election happens, Donald Trump gets elected, and what does Carter Page do to celebrate? He flies back to Moscow. Um, this was the headline in the New York Times, December 8th, quote, Carter Page, ex-Trump advisor with Russian ties, visits Moscow. It's lovely in December. Page would later admit that on that trip, right after the election, he again met with some of the same Russian government and Rosneft officials that he had met with before. Continuing scrutiny of Carter Page's ties to the Russian government meant that even during the presidential transition, the soon-to-be Trump administration still had to go out of their way to disavow him, to pretend like he had never been announced as one of Trump's five foreign policy advisors. Carter Page is an individual who the president-elect does not know and was put on notice months ago by the campaign. That was January 2017, before the inauguration. And, you know, we can piece together from the timing that that is probably around the time when the FISA surveillance warrant on Carter Page was being renewed. FISA warrants have to be renewed every 90 days. In order to renew them, U.S. investigators, law enforcement, they have to show a judge that there has been continued production of useful intelligence from the existing warrant. They have to show that there's been continuing or even fresh indications that the target of the warrant is, in fact, acting as a knowing agent of a foreign power. So that FISA warrant for Carter Page was initially granted in either the summer or the fall. It's hard for us to tell. We know that it was renewed multiple times. We think probably one of the times it was renewed was in January, right after Carter Page took his post-election trip to Moscow and Sean Spicer walked up to that podium and said, Donald Trump definitely doesn't know him. And we now know that in the spring of 2017, after the inauguration, once the Trump administration was sworn in, the FBI went back to the judge, went back to the FISA court judge, again, with whatever evidence they had that this warrant was continuing to be productive, there was reason to renew it again. And the judge okayed it. The judge signed off on that warrant in the spring. It was either the third time or the fourth time that a judge had looked at the evidence about Carter Page and signed off on continuing surveillance of him as a potential foreign agent. And that story, that's what this dumb memo is all about. This memo you've been hearing so much about, 
The memo that is apparently going to be released tomorrow over the vehement objections of the Justice Department and the FBI because it contains classified information about how the FISA court works and how FISA court warrants are adjudicated and what kind of surveillance the government does on targets that it believes are foreign agents. That memo that has been the focus of so much media attention and so much excitement on the right over the past few weeks, what's that memo about? That memo is a House Republican effort to try to make you believe that either the third or fourth renewal of that surveillance warrant against Carter Page is a terrible scandal. How could anybody approve that? There are multiple reports that President Trump fervently believes this memo is what he needs to end the Robert Mueller investigation. Because this memo will make America believe that only terrible, like what, Clinton stooges would support the third or fourth renewal of a foreign agent surveillance warrant on the guy who's been on the FBI's counterintelligence radar since at least 2013 when he played a starring role as the enthusiastic idiot in a convicted Russian spy ring in New York who then later turned up multiple times in Moscow denouncing the United States praising Vladimir Putin and trying to get Russian business deals for himself with Russian state-run companies while meeting with Russian government officials. If Russian intelligence mounted its operation against our presidential campaign in part because they wanted to try to undo U.S. sanctions on Russia, this is the guy from the Trump campaign who says that during the campaign, yeah, he was in Moscow meeting with high-ranking government officials about getting rid of U.S. sanctions on Russia. If it is a scandal that that guy would have a surveillance warrant against him renewed, then yeah, this memo tomorrow from House Republicans is going to blow your socks off. Of all the ways they have tried to undermine or just block the Mueller investigation, the story of this guy, this guy is not the guy you think they would try to hang that whole strategy on. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.